uh, will communicate uh, how it's coming. Praise the Lord. Uh, several weeks ago, right before Mother's Day, we uh, started. Uh, I knew I was going to have to break this up. So this is going to be one of those deals that were, uh, it gives me a little more time to present it because we, we started this first message a couple of weeks ago before Mother's Day. And we're calling this the ultimate. Everybody say the ultimate. Now, when you, when you say something's ultimate, that's, that's pretty clear. So when I say this is the ultimate revelation of God, well, there's a lot of things to learn about God. But when we declare, when we start kind of tying this in, the ultimate revelation of God is because this springs forth. You get this, it, it, it affects everything else. And uh, so we're talking about what that ultimate revelation is. And so we, we got into some of that. And then we had Mother's Day, and then we were out of town last Sunday on a little vacation, and Brody did a wonderful job preaching the Word. And so we're going to pick this back up this morning. And how many of you were here several weeks ago, we're talking about the ultimate revelation of God. We, we touched on it, and so we're going to get into a little more because this affects so many different things. Um, let's just give you the Scripture first. This was our, our, our main text that we used. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. How many believe it with me this morning? You know... Uh, Utterance is greatly affected by the hearer. That means you can pull this morning if you stay alert and ready. And all right, I'm helping pastor, believing for uh, the utterance this morning. We could even say some things that uh, I didn't know exactly it would come out that good. Praise the Lord. So 1 John 3, 1 says, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. You could just camp out right there. What does God call us? Children of God. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing about this subject. That As I'm laying this out and even reading it, this is something that most of us have a working knowledge of. We kind of know, okay, because if you've, if you've studied the Bible, you've been in church long enough, you know phrases like, you know, Jesus said your heavenly Father knows what you have need of before you ask, and we know we have a Father. How many of you understand that concept? There, God is not just God, but He's Father. Now, most of us have that concept. He's but, but here's the deal. We, we kind of think of ourselves more as a servant of God than a child of God. The more you understand what I'm trying to help you with, that we have a father, it helps your identity, which is what we're going to get to here in just a minute, knowing who you are. Because Jesus was real clear on who he was and, what God, and who God said he was. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, you need to know as a child of God, he's already well pleased with you. So you don't have to work for anything. See, if you've been here on Wednesday nights and then Sunday, we've touched on a little bit. You know, I, I've talked about there's basically three perceptions that people live from in society. Number one, if you're saved, you're born again, you're living in the spirit. That's a perspective. You're living in the spirit, from the spirit. Then there's another place where you can be saved, but you're dealing more with the kingdom of self. You really haven't discovered who you are, and so you have more of an orphan spirit. You're working for everything. You're having to accomplish everything. This is what I'm going to do for God instead of I'm going to live from God. So people are living, trying to do it for God, and then there's just a, a, a majority of people who are just unsaved. And the problem is if you're in this part, if you're just saved, and you're never renewing your mind, then the world out here is affecting you because you're conformed by the world instead of being transformed from here by the renewing of your mind. So you come out of just living for this selfish kingdom and, and who am I and this orphan mentality to now I'm a child of God and I live from the spirit of life and I work for him. I work for pleasure, not from pressure. Are you here? But this, this has just been blowing me away because I, I've been walking with God for four, ministry for 40 years. But you continue to grow in revelation and knowledge. And all of a sudden, God just kind of, and I know why, because I'm, I'm praying about saying, Lord, why am I getting this now? Because there's, there's levels that you grow in and, you, and, and it's coming from this place. I saw it because he's done a work in me in love and the revelation of the love of God. I mean, we're writing little books on it. But now, all of a sudden, I see the aspect of it and the Father's heart and the love that comes from God that all goes together. And then it ties you in with your identity. And you see the aspect of covenant. And, you, and it just all of a sudden, it's like I'm seeing just bam, 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 all these different directions. And it's all pointing to Him and who the Father is and who He's called us to be. And it helps you lift. Just, it's totally transforming. So, so He said the Father... Loves us so much. See how great a love that he has for us that he took people that 
Paul said in Ephesians that we're enemies of God. And he says, but God, being rich in mercy, whereby he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we've been saved. But, he, but, but that salvation, that love, saw us before the foundation of the world. So in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons, Ephesians 1, 4 says. So he already chose you. So you got an A plus on your report card. But because you know who you are, now you live for him. And so he says we become, he calls us children of God. Say children of God. God. Now that needs to start ringing in your ear in a whole new light. Because you might, oh, I'm a child of God. We sing, "Ah, I'm a child of God. But it needs to ring totally differently. Because if you don't recognize and know who you are, you're seeing yourself more as a servant. Like the prodigal son brother who stayed out in the field and he saw himself more of a servant, and we talked about that last time, than, than he was coming and saying, my, and the father said, all that I have is yours. You want to throw a party? Throw a party. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So he says, and such we are for this reason, back to verse 1, the world doesn't know us because they didn't know him. Verse 2, beloved, now we are children of God. You're born again. You're a child of God. And he says, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, he, we will be like him because he will, we will see him just as he is. And everyone that has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. So back to this, the more you begin to see who you are, it affects how you live. And you keep yourself in a place because you know you're solid on who you are. You don't have to prove anything to anybody else. You don't have to get enough likes to have a good day or not. Amen. And your social media. Amen. Or... You know, you don't have to run over somebody to know that God's going to take care of you. You don't have to, you don't have to press your way and run over five people to get, because I've got to do this. You know, God's taking care of you. Your father's watching over you. So we're going to continue with this. It's, it's, it's taking me over. It's invaded my thought and, and where I'm going and what I'm looking at. And, and, and it's just recognizing and knowing God as father. That sounds so basic, doesn't it? I became so curious about it. Yesterday, I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I have, because things were busy. And, and so yesterday, most of the afternoon, I just, I went through the book of John. Because I went through Matthew. How many times is the word father mentioned in the book of Matthew? And it's 38 times. But the book of John, the word father is mentioned 124 times just in the book of John. 124 times. And you begin to see, wow, this is, there is a revelation here. And we talk, we just, we just kind of inched into that. And I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute. But, but, but I'm saying we might have some head knowledge of this, but, but do we have the revelation? Are we experiencing it? Uh, is it affecting us, who we are? Let me say, like, let me back up just a minute. God created the universe as a father, meaning he left his father imprint on every aspect of creation. He created it from a father's heart, from a father's perspective, Fatherhood begins in him. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shifting. In other words, he's nothing but light. There is no sin never came from him. He's total light. Darkness, there's no darkness in him. He doesn't change. So think about this. So in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, Paul says this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. Every family. Now, the word family in the Greek is patria, which is derived from patir, the Latin word for father. So, really, the best translation of that would be, I bow my knees to the Father from whom every fatherhood in heaven and on earth derives its name. So, the the whole concept of fatherhood, fathering, comes from God. That's where it comes from. He, was, he, he, he responds to creation, everything from that aspect. It's, and it's, it's, it's such a, a beautiful heart. There's, there's really, and as I'm studying, there's really no greater, as a father, you should understand this. There is no greater demonstration of who God is than you living as a father the way the father God does. No greater picture. You cannot display a greater demonstration of love and who God is to your kids, to your family, to your neighborhood, to whoever you come in, than than you representing Father. Nothing greater. Because that's who Jesus came to manifest. That's who Jesus came to demonstrate. And we got to that. I'll touch back on that in just a minute. Hallelujah. So all fatherhood 
began in heaven, which leads us to the fatherhood of God, which is the ultimate revelation of God himself. So you want to talk about the ultimate revelation. It's the fatherhood of God. It's the nature. It's the heart of God. He is a good Jesus said, if earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? I mean, Jesus had a lot to say. If you go through John, there was a lot that Jesus was demonstrating and talking about the, the woman at the well. The Father seeks after worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. I mean, and then you got this display of there's a, there's a little Jesus is going back and forth with the Pharisees about, about his father and their father. Anybody remember that? He said, my father, but your father is the devil. Your father the devil, and you, you act like the devil because your father, he's the father of lies. See, everything comes from an aspect of fatherhood. What do you demonstrate as a father? Father of lies, father of truth. I mean, there's a spirit, and I may get into this later because there's such another whole aspect of spiritual fatherhood. Abraham's called the father of faith, and we are to imitate what Abraham did, follow in his steps. Paul said, you have many spirit, you, ha you, ha you have a lot of teachers, but you have not many fathers. He said, I am your father in the faith. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. So we are to imitate the fathers. You can't leave the fathers behind. Honor your father. I mean, there's just so much and we, so that's a whole nother, didn't mean to go into that so much, but, but eternally God is the father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the intimate, that intimate relationship existed before creation ever even began. Uh, remember John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. You, you might say that was Jesus, but he was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And if you actually go to Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom speaking says, I was with God in the beginning, and I was his delight. He rejoiced in me, and we created. I got everything God created through him. So it's amazing. So we see something special about God. In God, there's not only fatherhood, but there's also relationship. And this is what's just, this is what's just, it's almost reforming. That's a good way to put it. It's like, you begin to see, you, you can't have a family without a, without a father, right? <laughs> so this thing, everything God is doing, what God is, do, is bring, we are just, a, he's a father and we're his family. People, I'm, I guarantee you haven't seen it like we're going like to dish this out here just a minute. Because there's a relation, Christianity is not a religion, it's a family. It's a father and his children. It's real clear. I mean, the Bible talks about Galatians 6. I mean, you, I mean, the whole other direction here, the household of faith. Galatians 6 says, do good to all men and especially to the household of faith. Hebrews 3 talks about judgment begins with the household of God. I mean, there's so many different aspects of this. And Ephesians 2, 17, that we're no longer strangers and aliens, but we are partakers of this, you know, this the household of God. This, we are the fathers. We are a part of his family. And a good father is going to take care of his kids, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. So according to 1 John 4, 16, we see that God's eternal nature is love, right? 1 John 4, 16 says, we have known and believed the love God has for us. you got to believe in that love. You don't just believe in him. God believes in you. But we believe in that love that he has for us. That's his nature. And then if you combine these facts, we see God as a father created the universe in love. And in countless ways, the universe he created is the expression and the outworking of his fatherly love. And so he responds to all creation as a father. So this brings us back to Jesus. One of the reasons, and this is where we kind of got into the first message, one of the reasons Jesus came was not only to complete and fulfill the message of the prophets, because they prophesied so many different things, but also to bring the revelation that no prophet could bring, and that's the revelation of the father. That's what Je Jesus came to manifest that. Remember to Philip. He told Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I mean, John 16, 17, he says, the, fa all fa the, fa all the Father loves you. Just like he loves me. He loves you. There's so many examples of this, and he's referring to the Father 124 times. 
So John 17, 16, Jesus said, and in verse 26, two times in John 17, which is the high priestly prayer that Jesus prayed, six different times he mentions the name Father in that prayer, talking to the Father, praying to the Father. Matter of fact, if you go back to John 14, 15, 16, Jesus, in that day you'll ask me nothing. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And he talks a lot about asking there's a lot about asking. But see, if you don't have a confident relationship with your father, you're not asking right. I'm going to tell you straight up. You are not asking right. You're not boldly asking or not even asking but demanding in prayer those things that actually belong to you. In the name of Jesus. We come to the father through the son. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the father but through me. In other words, I'm going to lead you to him. That's He's the ultimate destination. So he said, I manifest, this is Jesus here. He said, I manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. Again, and then in verse 26, I manifested your name. What does that mean? Well, the, you know, what name did he manifest? Well, we mentioned for 2,000 years, people knew the name, the sacred name, Yahweh, Jehovah. But what was the name Jesus manifested? It was the Father. Jesus came to manifest the name the name Father, who he is, what he looks like, what he would do. Do you want to know what the Father's like? Just look at Jesus. He's good. He heals. He saves. He delivers. He renews. He restores. He does miracles. Hallelujah. So he didn't just come to talk about it, but he came to demonstrate it. So how did he do it? How did Jesus demonstrate it? This is what was just revolutionary. He lived like a son. How did Jesus demonstrate the Father? He lived like a son. He knew who he was. Matter of fact, if you read it, he says, I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. He told the disciples, I'm going away, and you ought to be glad that I'm going away, because when I go, the Father will send the Holy Spirit. I mean, they're all working together. And so he was, he, Jesus, I mean, if you look at, the people saw a different kind of life when they saw Jesus, a life unbroken, a life of unbroken fellowship, total dependence upon God. Jesus said, I only say what I hear the Father say. I only do what I see the Father do. I came to do the will of the Father. I mean, it was all about him. He is focusing on, Jesus said, he's in me and I'm in him. And a matter of fact, a couple of different times in John, when Jesus called himself and said, I'm a son of God, he's my father, they wanted to stone him, run him off a cliff because he identified, it says he saw him, he declared that he was equal with God. When you say, I'm the son of God, he's my father, I'm his son, you say you're equal with him, and they did not like that. And they wanted to stone him. What about you? How do you see yourself? It's a good question, see? How you living? See, if you're a joint heir with Christ Jesus, and God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus, it's a different aspect here. It's a different concept. It's a different way this affects how we live. Come on now. We're not just, we're not just orphans trying to make something happen here. All things belong to us. Praise the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal it. So Jesus was a man who lived like he had a Father in heaven. So when we come into the, when we come into the revelation of God as Father, it supplies some major benefits. So let's just touch on one of those benefits this morning and you could probably go for days and that number one and I mentioned it is identity one of the main benefits of recognizing who God is who who our father is it should affect who we are see how you see yourself determines how you see everything else how you see the world you cannot actually communicate properly with the world as a Christian if you do not see who you are because why because you don't see it right you won't see the world right You'll see a problem. God doesn't see a problem. God sees the answer. See, it totally affects how you see things in our, in our the perception. Everybody say identity. And when I say identity, you could, we could talk about who we are in Christ. We could go that whole that direction, who we are in Christ. But, but I'm going a little bit different direction. I think more a little bit because we could talk about self-worth and our value. We may touch on that. But, but specifically, this identity, for example, 
A person can't fully answer the question, who am I, without knowing who their father is. Well, who are you? See, that that's, question just really keeps coming up through this whole thing. Who are you? Who are you? Who are, who are you? Because everybody wants to know, who are you? What do you do? Well, who you are determines what you do. What you do doesn't determine who you are. What you do, who you are determines what you do. Do you understand? I said, who you are, when you see and know who you are, it determines what you do. A lot of people are trying to do because they don't know who they are. And so they do, 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 trying to figure out who they are, are, are. <laughs> so you got to answer that question. And that's why our culture is suffering from a major identity crisis. Multitudes are, and this is just the word I got in the title, the subtitle of the message, rootless. Don't be rootless. Anybody remember that show, Roots? I mean, Kunta Kinte, he wanted to know who his daddy was. That was the whole thing. Who, where'd I come from? And so you've got this whole culture of people that are rootless. But who, we, we find identity in our father. Who are we? We're, we are children of God. Woo! And there's so many good things. I, I, I mean... We, multitudes, when I say, they're, they're rootless. They have no sense of belonging. No sense of belonging. Christianity's answer to the identity crisis is to bring men and women into direct personal relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. That's simple. People who truly know God as Father no longer have an identity problem. They know who they are. They know who they are. They're children of God. And as children, we know we are loved by the Father who cares for us. And until we know who we are, we cannot see the world properly as we should. Or said this way, we can't see the world the way it truly is if we don't see who we are. So we've got to come to a place where we can look up and see a father who loves us. My father loves me. You can sing about it, but not really know it. My father loves me. Smith Wigglesworth used to have a statement. He said, my father takes care of me in grand style. I like to, I've adopted that for myself. My father takes care. So when I'm on my way somewhere, I don't care if I'm going on the mission field or where I'm going, I just declare my father takes care of me in grand style. And it's amazing. You get what you say. I mean, you just get favor, and God says something goes bad from, from good to gooder. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so we see God as someone who, who cares for us. Hallelujah. We, we belong, we don't, we belong like the, we, we belong to the best family in the universe. Think about it like this. Our father is emperor of the universe. I like the word emperor. Emperor of the universe. <laughs> That's our God. That's our father. You think he created man just to die and never exist anymore? He's worked on this thing for millennia. Created the planet just for us. The stars that he calls by name. He's created it for us, for his family. We're his family and this begins to go a whole new direction when you begin to see this because think about Romans 8, 19. Romans 8, 19, I love this. It says, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Who's that? Everybody say, that's me right there. Did you catch that? Creation is waiting for you to take your place. Birth pangs. The creation is groaning for the sons of God to take their place. Take their place. You think the millennium is just going to be clouds and harps and no, uh-uh. Woo! Ruling and reigning with Christ for eternity with the family. It's a family business. You talk about a family business. That's what this is here. Kingdom business, family business. Sonship has identity. And we've talked about it. It's a ring. It's authority. Identity creates intimacy. When you know who you are, you just come on in the house. Come on into the throne room. It has, it has authority. It has a ring. See, a lot of people get the robe. They get to heaven, but they don't, they don't understand their authority. You got a ring. You got authority. I'm going to come to something here in just a minute. We've talked about that. But it's not just about my robe of right, righteousness. That, that gets me to heaven. But I just, wanna, I just don't want to be able to touch heaven. I want to get heaven here. 
while I'm here. The purpose for church, listen, is family. That's why we got a lot of orphans running around. I don't like this bunch, I'm going to go over this bunch. I don't like this group, or we just going to branch off and start. No, families don't do that. Are you here? God has to have a family to sustain what he's doing. That's why so many churches struggle and people struggle. They don't see themselves as a family, just individual orphans trying to make it to heaven. <laughs> see, when you begin to understand more churches, more family... That's a, that's a, it's not just a big group or just some big organization. Oh, it's the church. No, it's a family. It's God and his family. And he even has spiritual fathers over the family. Hallelujah. He really does. It all comes back to who you are. As a church, an individual, what's, you know, Applying it both ways. As a, as who, what's your special sauce? As a church, what's our special sauce? You know what I mean by special sauce? What, 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 is, what gifts do you have? What talents do you have? What do you bring to the family? See, if you don't see things as a family, that's why so many people, church is kind of a take it or leave it type of thing. Well, if I, I no big deal. I don't have to show up. I don't have to go because you don't see it as the family and you're bringing your sauce to the table. You're bringing your family business to the business. But if you don't see it as that, you're going to be held accountable for your business. And unfaithfulness will be judged. It's important to understand. This is a family. You see this, a family concept. That's what's really blowing me away because I'm like, okay, I've been doing this for years, and I'm, I'm just seeing a different concept, just a different, just different light, revelation is what it's called. You just begin to see something in a different light. You get on something, and I'm like, wow, it's a family. In family, I mean, just... Can I get an amen? Like when it just comes to your person, isn't your family like the most precious thing that you know, that you have your family, your kids, your family, you get your family, you like your family get togethers? Isn't that precious when everybody's in unity and your family's all hanging out together? Isn't that fun? Don't you like that? I mean, you know, God loves that. When he, get, he, he, he desires relationship and intimacy. He loves it when we get together and he says, like, my kids are having a good time. Look at let's, let's go see what's going on. It's amazing. It comes back to who are you as a church, individual. Bring your saw, bring, your, bring what you have to the family table. This is a kingdom family. Heaven on earth is a family business. Jesus said in Matthew, or, you know, when he's 12 years old, when his parents came back to catch up with him, said, what are you doing in here? Boy, we've been looking for you for three days. Didn't you know I needed to be about my father's business? He was talking about the temple in the house. And then a little bit later, he's turning over tables one day. And he's, what are you doing? He said, don't make my father's house a den of thieves. Place of merchandise. This is my father's house. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. It's how we begin to see where this thing's supposed to launch out to. And we're just busy wrapped up in our own little world. Who am I? Yeah. Where am I going? Getting my paycheck. And it's bigger than your paycheck. It's a family. Is anybody understand, catching what I'm saying here? Who are you in, relation to, in relationship to him and, and then to other people? What do I have? My gifts, my talents, my calling. It helps me identify identity. It creates intimacy. Then comes inheritance. Children inherit. Don't read Galatians. I mean, you got Galatians 6 that... And Jesus says, if we're joint heirs, I mean, Galatians has just opened your eyes to this one. You got, we have an inheritance. And then you got destiny. What are you called to do? So here's the deal. Let me try to wrap this up. Revival changes lives. Churches, communities, that's revival. I mean, we kind of started this year, coming to this year thinking, okay, it's revival time. Let's, we're, God's not waiting on, he's, he, he's waiting on us. We're not waiting on him. I mean, let's, we talk coming in. Let's wait on God. Let's find out what God's doing. Let's, man, let's call on God. Let's, let's man, let's get after it here, right? Amen. And then God's telling us, okay, slow down. Wait, 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 wait on me. Mount up, draw near. And so revival's good. Revival changes. It changes lives and churches, communities, but reformation transforms culture. 
You think about Martin Luther's days, Reformation. That was a, they call it time of Reformation because people didn't have Bibles. Everybody had to go to the priests. And, but then all of a sudden, Martin Luther says, no, righteousness by faith. And people started getting the word. And now, now they can read the Bible for themselves. And so you get these different periods over time. And through history, you got different revivals and different periods of Reformation. And I said all that because you have to have a culture to change the culture. And you can't establish a family culture on earth without understanding who you are or who we are. A family, a family culture. I think the greatest reformation taking place, and it has to do with the Father, is an agape revolution. Everybody say, y'all know what agape, y'all know what agape reformation is? The greatest concept that somebody can begin to grasp, grasp a hold of and begin to walk in and is the love of God. Simply put. It's the love of God. Why? Because God is love. And he said, be imitators of me and walk in love. Paul said, make it your aim. Make it your goal. Make it your pursuit. Love. He says, if you walk in love, you won't break any Ten Commandments. Paul said in Romans 13, if you walk in love, you wouldn't, you wouldn't break any other ten. A new, so we have, this, we have this new commandment, this new message that we, that we have. Why? Because this is a family of love. We got a new language that goes with the family. It's a language of love. <laughs> new love. Everybody say new love. It's a new commandment. Walk in love, you wouldn't. Hurt anybody else. You won't do anybody else wrong. You, you wouldn't say anything that would take anybody down. You, you understand? It's a totally different way of living. What wins the world is love. People don't know what to do with love. When you just walk in love, they, they just don't know what, they don't know how to handle it. I mean, they, they're ready to chew you out and you just stay in love and they're like, okay. okay. <laughs> and you walk in love, you know, and God's going to take care of you. And even if they run over you, I mean, there's a time you don't get, you know, there's, there, you know Jesus didn't get run over, but he walked in love because he was love. He demonstrated it. And it's the, it all comes from the Father. Everything is, all this is pointing back to him because it's who God is. It's the Father's heart. The world sees that we're his disciples. Jesus gave the disciples, he said, you're to love one another as I have loved you. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He gave himself for it, laid his life down. It's all, it all goes back to how this, this affects everything. Hallelujah. When Jesus said that, he said, a new, uh, he said oh, hey, some new stuff here, guys. Love one another. That, that was, they had the, the verb form, agapeo, but they didn't have the noun form, agape. You have it. Romans 5, 5, it is shed abroad in your hearts. You got it now. You, I'm expecting you to live like me. And that's what he's telling them. So it's a divine love. It's radically different from the world's definition. It's the, it's, it's, it's the law. It's life. It's, it's the joy of the family. So we can say it like this. There's a baptism of water. There's a baptism of the spirit. And then here's next. There's a baptism of love. Hallelujah, because you can know it. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm also walk. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love's the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, but, but I'm talking about you. You're so baptized in the love of God. It affects everything that you do. That you have, you have to live from that place of the Spirit. It's living from the Spirit. It's, Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, you really love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will love you. And, I will man and my father will love you. And we will manifest ourselves. We will come making a boat. We will show up at your house. We will manifest ourselves to you because you walk in love. How powerful is that? So this is where we get emerged in the father's love. And we get, see, we, we get set free from anything else. See, there's, it, it's not a darkness problem. It's a lack of light. See, it's not a fear problem, it's a lack of love, because perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love. Everybody say, perfect love. Think about that. Cast out all fear. How can you walk in fear if you got perfect love operating on the inside of you? And where it's all coming from. See, we're, we're living from love, not towards love. 
This is where we're living from. Okay, let me close with this, and I'll set this up. You, you know this, and I'll, I'll, I'll wind this down. Matthew chapter 16, because this blesses me. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and 15, Jesus said, who do, you, who do the people say that I am first? He said, who do the people say that I am? And some say, you're Elijah the prophet, you're then. And he said, okay, who do you say that I am? You remember that story? Yeah. Who do you say that I am? Well, have you made that, have you made that discovery for yourself? Who do, you, who do you say Jesus is? Anybody know what Peter said? Peter's the one that piped up. He said, you are the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, Peter, Petra, little rock, you, 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 were, you were Cephas, now you're Peter, you're little rock. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my father who is in heaven. Peter got a father revelation that came along with the son revelation. You're, you're not just, you're the Messiah, you're the, but you are son of God. You can't be a son without a father, right? <laughs> Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my father who is in heaven. And upon this, what? Rock, this revelation here. Rock means revel, upon this revelation. Father, son, I'll, I'll come back. I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. This father, son, this family picture here. Father, son, family. Jesus, your elder brother. <laughs> you're, 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 you're joint heirs with him. So now watch this. So he says, you got this revelation and what's interesting, right after that is, well, let me back up. He said, on this rock. Now, the word stone in Hebrew means ebin. Ebin. Eb, ab, father. Bin means son. So, upon this stone, this rock, father, son, I'm going to build my church. Got that picture? Ab, Eb, Ben. Ben means son. Eb, father. So upon this revelation, upon this rock of this revelation, the father, the son relationship, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against. And you know what comes next? And I'll give you, watch this now. You get this. He said, and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. That's authority. Whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, will be loosed in heaven. What comes, what, what comes next, right, if you get that revelation? All right, I know, I know who I am now. I got, this, I got this picture. Keys of the kingdom. Keys of the kingdom. Revelation. Father. Everybody say Father. Father. Oh, we got a lot more to get into. I'm done. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't know if I'm helping you as much as it's hard to communicate when it's coming from five different angles and directions. I'm like, okay, I'm, see, I'm seeing covenant and I'm seeing identity. I'm seeing righteousness and I, I'm seeing uh, authority and, and I'm seeing family. And, and it's all pointing back to my father here. Okay, I got, I got to wrap all this together here and, and my value and my worth. Jesus didn't die for you to make you valuable. He died for you because you were valuable. You already were. I feel the anointing in here. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. See, it's all about recognizing, man, because the devil wants to just beat us down and tell us you're no good and you never had mounted anything. That's what he tried to come. If you're the son of God. Remember that right from the beginning. As soon as God says, you're my beloved son, I'm well pleased, go out in the wilderness. And the devil says, if you're the son of God, attacking who he was, don't let the devil attack who you are. Because who you are is not based on what you did or what you've done. It's who you already are in him. You see yourself in him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you learning anything? 
Let's thank God. Stand up. Let's just thank him that he's helping. Now, now this will, all this that we're sharing, this just helps you now as you begin to read. Because even communicating these things, you'll, you'll get little bits and pieces and you'll, you'll see some light on different things because even you don't even get it all the first time. That's why I'm, you know, when I'm going back, I'm like, I got I to read that again. I got I to hammer that. But you'll get bits and pieces. But as you're studying, as you're reading, put on your sunglasses. S-O-N. Put on your sunglasses. And now you're seeing things from, oh, the sun's perspective now. Okay, all right, I get it. <laughs> Not your perspective. Thank you, Jesus. Go through John, look at, you might do that. Go through John, look at, I'll look, that'll give you some good homework. Just go through John and look at all those father references. I like it when he told Pilate. He said, Pilate said, well, if I, you know, I could set you free. I have the authority. Jesus, uh, you have no authority unless my father gave you that authority. Everything was, Jesus was so conscious of the father right there. He said, he actually said, the father never leaves me. Because I always do what pleases the Father. So we want to come to a place where we're so conscious that, man, the Father, me, we're, and we're workers together with him. We're partners. That's that coin. You know what fellowship means? Koinonia. It's that unity that we're working together. And we're just, it's like this big family. I just see such a family. I, I believe it's like God can totally change our, our culture mentality here with that one thought. We're a family. I've never communicated that in 31 years of pastoring almost now. I've never really, I mean, you hear it, you know, we're the family of God, and you sing, we won in the family, uh, and we went Rhema. But you can, you can, you can know, you can be all over something and not see it. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit can open our eyes. That's why we want to pray. Lord, help me to see. And you get a glimpse of something like this. And now, now you're looking for it. Oh, okay, Woo. Ooh. ooh. So, Lord, we just thank you this morning. Thank you, Father, for showing us who you are and who we are. Hallelujah, that you love us so much that you sent your son, Jesus, because you wanted a family. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands to heaven. Lord, just let your spirit, let your, let your spirit of love just, to, just begin to baptize us with your love, Lord, like never before, just anointing flowing through us and upon us, Lord, that we can just... We can just begin to sense it and take it and begin to walk in that love and the power of that love that you demonstrate towards us. And you've called us to be your representatives in this earth. People see you through us. Help us to be your ambassadors, your representatives on this planet. Most importantly, your children. And we'll do like Jesus and we'll live like people who have a father in heaven. We're living every day with a conscious revelation of who we are, children of God, about to be manifested before all of creation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. While your head's bowed, your eyes are closed, if you're here and you say, Pastor Bracken, I'm not sure right now if I was to die, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure if I was to die, my, my heart's right with God, and I, I just want to make that correction today. I, I need Jesus in my life. I, I, I want to come home. I want to be like that prodigal son. We talked about him in that first message. He came home. He said, my father. And the father didn't just put a robe on him. He just didn't invite him back to be a servant. He thought, well, at least I'll just be a servant. But the father said, no, get the robe, get a ring, kill the fatted calf. Listen, because you're that valuable to him. And if, you're not, if your heart's not right with Jesus today, you say, pastor, would you, I, I need to get my heart. Would you lift up your hand and say, pray for me? If that's you, just lift your hand real high. Pastor, would you include me in this prayer this morning? I need to get my heart right with Jesus. Anybody like that? See, if just a few hands going up. Anyone else? Pastor, pray for me. God bless you, sir. I see that hand back there. Yes, sir, I see that hand. Everybody just pray this out, pray out loud with me. Everybody come on, just pray together. Say, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you for your mercy. And I call Jesus my Lord. I believe that he died for me. And he was raised up for me. And he took away all my sin and gave me robe of righteousness. And now I'm saved. I call him Lord. And I choose to serve you. Thank you for not only making me a servant, but more important, making me a son or a daughter. Hallelujah. And I rest 
Oh, you got to rest right there. I rest in the finished work of the blood of Jesus. And now I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ. I have a new position. I have a new life. I've been born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm free. And who the Son has set free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Let's just praise Him and thank Him for it. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Now, if you're praying that, that's done. That's, it's, not hard to get, it's not hard to get saved. Anybody makes it hard, it's not hard. You just call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says you get saved. But now you begin to walk it out. Renew your mind. Get in church. Stay in church. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves all the more. Why? Because that's our family as we see the day drawing near. Amen. Did you get something this morning? Well, Brody, who's closing? You're right behind me right there. All right. We love you guys. Stay with us because uh, we're going to get into some more of this. So. Yes, hallelujah. Well, we just want to let you know we did fix the pipe. So if you need to use the restrooms right over here, you're more than welcome to go to the restroom. We do ask you to leave out the west side doors because they're pulling up flooring and everything out there. So, uh, But we do have Wednesday night service this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We'd love to see you here. We don't have food in the cafe, but still come hungry for the Word of God. And we'll see you on Wednesday night. You have a blessed weekend and a great Memorial Day tomorrow.